coming back to the heart of worship. Man, I hope you can say that today. No false motives, no agendas, just to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and the beauty of His holiness. He's worthy. Give King Jesus a big round of applause. Hope you ladies enjoyed the Mother's Day banquet yesterday. Thank you to everyone who put that on. Uh, Tab and Ashley and, and, and so many of you ladies just banded together to make this special for all of our mothers. And so we appreciate that so, so very much. Today, I was tempted to stick with Philippians chapter 4. But you're going to find out that there are two bickering women who Paul, by divine inspiration, points out in Philippians chapter 4. And I thought, man, I don't know that I want to talk about two bickering women on Mother's Day. So I felt led of the Spirit of God, <coughs> my wife, I felt led by the Spirit of God, it's a joke, <laughs> to look at Proverbs chapter number 31. All of you ladies are probably familiar with the beautiful portrait of biblical womanhood that is painted in Proverbs 31. If you've never heard of a Proverbs 31 woman, you're going to hear about her today. And so I want to draw your attention to Proverbs 31. I want to read verse number 1. And then I want to drop down to verses 10 through 31. Because that will be our context today. And I want you to stay with me, okay? I want you to follow along. I want you to concentrate and work and listening. Because I believe there is something here in this passage of Scripture that will not only help every mother here, but every woman here and fail us. And even help us as well. So Proverbs chapter number 31, verse number 1. Says the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. Now, from verses two through verses number nine, she gives him a strong warning about women, wine, and justice. Okay, that's a good message for all of you young men in here today, whether you're kings or not, but that's not the message today, right? We're not preaching to the young men. But let me say, you gotta be careful with the ladies. You got to be careful with the bottle, right? And you need to make sure to pursue justice, seek mercy, and walk humbly with your God. In verse number 10, we'll pick up a reading where she begins to tell him about this virtuous woman, the kind of wife that she wants him to have, the kind of mother that she desires for his children. Verse number 10, who can find a virtuous woman? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusted her so that he will have no lack of gain. She will do him good all, or excuse me, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and she works willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. And she brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and gives food to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considers a field and she buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. She clothes herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. Her candle does not go out by night. She lays her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the staff. She stretches out her hand to the poor, and she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and it's purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes fine linen and sells it and delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she will rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the teaching of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. 
Many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is a beautiful portrait of biblical womanhood. You say, Brother Reggie, this was written thousands of years ago to a different culture in a different time. But today what I want to do is concentrate on the truth and the relevancy of this passage of Scripture, even in 2022. And I want to give a challenge to being a Proverbs 31 woman in 2022. I want to remind you that as we look into the book of Proverbs today, that this is the wisdom book. It was written by Solomon, the wisest of the wise, as God moved upon him in power and in wisdom. In this book, we learn that there are three sources of wisdom that God grants each of us, and these sources of wisdom flow through relationships. The Bible is a relational book. Thank God we can have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. The first way that we can receive wisdom is through a relationship with God. God the Father so desired to have a relationship with you that He done all He could do by sending His Son to die in your place as the sin substitute on the cross of Calvary. And so thank God wisdom comes from God. If any man lack wisdom, let him seek God who gives to all men liberally, right? If God is liberal in any way, shape, or form, he is liberal in giving wisdom to those who ask for it. The second relationship that channels or that wisdom flows from is the relationship we have with our parents. There's a lot of godly ladies in here today. There's a lot of godly men in here today. And young people, listen to me. Right now, you probably think your mom and dad doesn't have much wisdom or even much knowledge. You might not think that they understand what it's like to be a teenager in 2022. You might even go so far, and you might not say this out loud, at least I hope you wouldn't, but you might think this in your heart of hearts. They're out of touch. They're a little crazy. Their expectations far supersede reality. When you hit about 2021, you're going to realize that they're a whole lot wiser than you thought they were. Amen? And so we can get wisdom from God. We can get wisdom from our parents. But also, we find this next and last relationship. We can get wisdom from our husband or our wife in a marital relationship. I'm thankful that God has given me Ashley, the wife he's given me. She is very wise. She speaks into my life. I value her opinion. I believe that she hears from God. I believe that God moves in her life. I believe God directs her. And so if we are ever coming to a big decision and she is at the west and I am at the east, we're totally in disagreement. Something's wrong, right? So we have to sit down and we have to pray through this and we have to weed through this. And can I tell you, I have received a lot of wise counsel from God. I received a lot of wise counsel from my parents, but I've also received a lot of wise counsel from my wife. Now that's where you men should be saying, hey Amen, Brother Reggie. Well, I'm getting you some brownie points there. I want you to know that this passage that we are looking at today is just not a passage of antiquity. It's an amazing passage, ladies and gentlemen. It's a passage of scripture that gives us a portrait of what true biblical womanhood looks like. And ladies, whether you're 15 or whether you're 55 or whether you're 85 today, I hope that you are trying to model your life by this example. If you're looking for a good example, look no farther than Proverbs 31. I did a little research and I looked up the 10 most famous women in the world. Most of these are musicians. Most of these are actresses and celebrities. 
They do this by Google searches. They do this by social media influence. The number one most famous and influential woman in the world is still Oprah Winfrey. She has a net worth of more than $2 billion. That's a lot of money, y'all. Adele made the list. Beyonce is still on the list. There's some others that I don't believe are worth mentioning, so we're going to move on from them, amen? But out of all of those ladies, I don't know that any of them would necessarily, I know this is kind of a judgmental statement, and I'm not trying to be that guy, I don't know that any of them would fit the pattern of a Proverbs 31 lady. I went through and I, I tried to do more research. I tried to find testimonies. I, I tried to find biblical principles being carried out in their life. And so listen to me, young ladies. You have to know that the world is trying to show you what a woman looks like. And if you're not careful, you will be deceived when God will show you in his scripture what a woman really looks like. And you need to follow God instead of culture. Amen. Come across this word virtuous. This virtuous woman, this Proverbs 31 woman, and immediately there's something very interesting that jumps out to me. The word virtuous is an interesting term, especially when describing a woman in this historical setting. You know why? Because it's a military term. It's a military term meaning to be valiant, to have valor, strength, ability, efficiency, no matter the opposition, no matter the obstacles that one would face. This virtuous woman is like a general on a battlefield with her family as her unit, and she's going to do whatever it takes to win this battle because her family is at stake. Wow. I've read this passage so many times, I've spoken to women's groups about this passage and I don't know that I've ever really broken that word down an interesting word today what I want to do by way of introduction is I want us to notice five traits quickly five traits about this virtuous woman five traits that I hope every one of you ladies will possess if not today will one day possess and I promise you you can by the help and aid of the word of God through the power and leadership of the Holy Spirit the first thing that I notice right off the bat when you look at this passage of scripture is the capacity of this Proverbs 31 woman she has a great capacity She's kind, she's wild, she's godly, she's strong, she's capable, she's compassionate, she's faithful, she's benevolent, she's persistent, she's trustworthy. She has her hand involved in so many things. It seems like there's a lot of arms in her fire. And I immediately say, how does she do it from sun up to sundown? She does so many things. And isn't that what ladies do, guys? They are queens of multitasking. Now, men, you were not wired up that way. And I was not wired up that way. Sometimes I love to just sit and watch Ashley. <laughs> I'll sit in a chair with a cup of coffee and she'll be carrying on three conversations at one time while she's making me more coffee. She's wiping off the counter and she's baking something in the oven. Can I tell you, I can't do that. Whatever's in the oven's going to burn. The coffee's going to probably scorch and I can care less about the counter. And while she's doing all that, I'm sitting watching and I probably should be helping in amazement of my wife. Multitask. Ladies, how many hats do you wear? And you wear them with elegance and you wear them with grace and you wear them with strength. Guys, we're so quick to compartmentalize, right? As a matter of fact, you can probably tell this illustration very, very easily by looking at your wife's computer. I got one application working at a time. That's all I can handle, one application. And I close that one down and start up a new application. When my wife comes and gets on my laptop and I open it up, I always go, oh my goodness, because there's 36 tabs open. 
And she knows what every one of them are, and they are very important to her. And she does not want me to close those tabs. Reggie, why did you close that tab? How do you even remember you had that tab open? I'm confused, right? Multitask. Then I also want you to notice that he talks about her discernment. This is a mother who is instructing a king, and we're going to get to that here in just a little bit. She has a discerning spirit about her. Ladies, this is something that you have that many men don't have. Now, we do have a gift called discernment. It's a spiritual gift. Man, my wife's got it. There are ladies in here that I have personally talked to you. I know you have it. And they just know things. There are times on to say, how did mama know that? And I said, mama's just no, bro. Mama's no. You ain't going to get anything past her, and you should try to. You're going to get busted. You're going to get caught. There's been people in my life that my wife has come to me, and she said, Rich, don't know about that dude. Come on now. This is a good dude. This is my buddy, Reg. I got, a, I got a funny feeling. It's like when you're with him, the Spirit of God on the inside of me cries out to warn you to protect you from him, and sooner or later it comes out. Guys, thank God for your wife. Think about the capacity. Think about all that she does. Children, think about all the hats your mother wears. Have you ever taken your mom for granted? What if she goes out of town for a day and dad normally fails miserably, right? <laughs> We're going to eat cakes and cookies and order pizza, right? We do that sometimes. Notice the second thing. Notice her character. Verse number 26, it says that she's wise and she's kind. These words are similar to the word grace. It means to be favored, to show favor towards, to be merciful. She's speaking gracefully. She's speaking favorably. She's speaking kindly. Why? Because that's what's in her heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to know what's in somebody's heart, just listen to them talk. Did you notice that this is not a list of how she looks? It doesn't talk about her hair or her eyes. It doesn't talk about her face. It doesn't talk about her lips. It doesn't talk about her hips. It doesn't talk about her uh, feminine features. It's talking about her character. This is about character. It's about what's on the inside, not what's on the outside. Had a young lady ask me last week, she said, Brother Reggie, how come I always draw the wrong kind of dude? Because you're using the wrong kind of bait. Can I preach for a second? If you want to catch a bottom feeder, be a night crawler. But if you want to attract somebody that loves God, who has integrity and character, the salmon, the halibut, well, then guess what? You need to be more worried about developing what's on the inside through the power of God than what's on the outside. Now, I'm not saying you cannot pamper yourself. I'm not saying you shouldn't be beautiful. You should be. But can I tell you, the inside is more important than the outside. You ever met somebody that you were not attracted to and all of a sudden you realize they drip with Jesus. They're in love madly with Jesus and all of a sudden they become beautiful to you. I give that illustration of the marriage counseling session one day, and the lady said, yeah, like you, Brother Reg. Yes, said, thanks. I appreciate that. And I'm glad you think I'm ugly. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I'm married anyway. Glory to God. Character. Character. Then I want you to notice her comprehensive value. She adds to everything. She adds to everything. She makes everything better. She makes her husband better. As a matter of fact, in the context of this, he would not be sitting in the gate or the government of the city and ruling with the elders if she wasn't the kind of woman that she was. She adds value to her children. She adds value to their home. She adds value to their income. This lady is thrifty, but she's also an entrepreneur. In the South, it's almost like if a woman works, she's a second-class woman. That goes against Proverbs 31. And can I tell you, for you stay-at-home moms, you all are working very, very hard. Trust me, 
I had a lady tell me one time, she said, Brother Reggie, she said, I would get more rest if I went back to work. Staying at home is tough. It's demanding. It's taxing. She's working. You all are working. You all are serving. You all are striving. You all are doing everything you possibly can to make your family the greatest family that it can be through the power of God. Wow, what a mother. Comprehensive value. I want to personally say today that I could not be who I am today if it was not for my wife. It's impossible. My children would not be what they are today if it wasn't for my wife. And my children aren't perfect. They've got a lot to learn and a long way to go, but I believe they're heading in the right direction. And can I tell you, a lot of that is because of her investment. She is adding value to her children. Next thing I want you to notice is that she's Christ-centered. She's Christ-centered. She fears the Lord, according to Proverbs 31. She's strong, but her husband is not the source of her strength. She's wise, but her husband is not the source of her wisdom. She's settled in a world that is shifting and chaotic, but her husband is not the source of her stability. You know who her source is? God is her source. Her husband is just her resource. You see the difference? Ladies, you are looking for a man, some of you, to make you happy, to give you strength, to add to you. We can't do it, and we're going to fail miserably if you look to us to do it. God's got to be your strength. God's got to be your shield. We are a resource that God can use, but can I tell you, when we're long dead and gone, God can still be blessing you and encouraging you and allowing you to grow to heights that you have never been to. Why? Because God is the source. And we are just a resource. I love verse number 25. This woman's not worried about the future at all. You know why? Because she trusts God. It says that she rejoices in the time of head. The New Living Translation says that she laughs at the day ahead. Everybody's worried. Everybody's fearful. Everybody's spreading. Oh, what's going to happen? Kind of sounds like today. Gas prices, food prices, inflation. I know. I know, trust me, I feel it. We're a family of seven. I feel it every day. I feel it when I pull up to the pub. I feel it when I go to the grocery store. But you know what she says? She says, God is my source. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the grass on the hill, the dirt under the hill. If there's any potatoes on the hill, he owns them. And guess what? God can give me them one hamburger at a time, one steak at a time, one filet at a time. She fears God. She trusts God. Man. How many of you struggle with worry? Yeah. Uh-huh. Worry is bringing tomorrow's fears into today and then sprinkling fertilizer on it so it can grow. Worry is paying interest on trouble that's not yet due and may never come due. This lady's not worried about what's taking place in society. She's focused on God. And then lastly, notice that she's compassionate. Verses 20, verses 27, verses 28. I'm going to call your attention back to it. But this lady loves God. And because she loves God, the love of God has been shed abroad in her heart. And she's compassionate and kind and merciful and gracious. Not only to those people in her family, but to all the poor and the needy. She works extra so that they that do not have can have. What a lady. What a lady. Now, remember the title of the message is a challenge to being a Proverbs 31 woman. So I want to clear up the confusion because maybe you ladies think that I'm just trying to challenge you to be a Proverbs 31 woman. But really, the sermon title has two meanings. There is a big challenge to being a Proverbs 31 woman. You know what the challenge is? Nine out of ten ladies who sit down and read this don't believe that it can ever be them. Don't believe that this would be a portrait or a picture of you. Don't believe that you could ever be described this way. You feel inadequate. You feel worthless. You feel like you've missed the mark. You feel like there's no hope. 
You deal with guilt. You deal with shame. You allow things to cripple you every day of your life. And you know what you do? You go ahead and put on your smile. You go ahead and you show up for duty and you be the best wife you possibly can be and the best mom you possibly can be when all along in your mind and in your heart you're really struggling with self-worth. Nine out of ten. There's a challenge. You know what's greater than being a Proverbs 31 woman? Believe in it. Believe in it. Ladies, I want you to say something with me today. I want you to repeat this after me. I can be a Proverbs 31 woman. Here we go. I can be a Proverbs 31 woman. You don't believe it. Say it with me. I can be a Proverbs 31 woman. I'm still not convinced. Bo, why are you repeating it? <laughs> he didn't, I'm joking. <laughs> Say it with me. I can be a Proverbs 31 woman. Now, let's get to the message that was introduction. Long introduction and a short message. Who is this woman? Who is she? If you know who she is, it makes all the difference in the interpretation of Proverbs 31. See, you think we're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, but we're not. You think we're talking about Elizabeth, John the Baptist mama, but we're not. You think we're talking about Ruth, but we're not. Go back to verse number one. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? This should not be a trick question. Owen. No, he didn't. You have lost your phone. You have lost your electronics. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? <laughs> oh, the preacher's son. Bob's the question. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Solomon. Solomon. Do you realize that when you go through the history of all the kings of Judah and all the kings of Israel, that you will not find a King Lemuel? He doesn't exist. You know why? Because according to Jewish historians, King Lemuel was the pen name for Solomon. He's just using a different name. Who was Solomon's mama? Bathsheba. Whoa, one of the most scandalous women of the Old Testament. And she shouldn't be, you know why? Because I believe we've got her story wrong. And I'm here today on the hill to set the record straight. You see, here's what I've heard before from pulpits. Here's what I've heard before from Bible lessons. Bathsheba was bathing, trying to be a seductive temptress and get David's attention. We put all the blame on a little Jewish girl. That's not the context of 2 Samuel 11. Bathsheba was just doing what she done daily. She was bathing. David was up in the springtime during the evening after his nap. He couldn't sleep. He was supposed to be on the battlefield, but guess what? He wasn't. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and all of a sudden, he saw this girl bathing, and the Bible says she was beautiful. And he looked, and then he took the second look, and then he took the third look, and then he began to think about who is she? And what would it be like to bring her to my room and spend the night with her? Ladies, I am tired of you all getting blamed for the lust in men's heart. Let me say that louder. I am tired of you all getting blamed for the lust that's in men's heart. Me and we have got to sit down and have a serious conversation with our teenage boys about lust. Listen, it doesn't matter what a woman walks across the front of this church in. If it's even in a bathing suit, I'm not condoning that. We want you to put your clothes on. But it's up to me whether I lust for her or not. That's my heart problem. Right? But it's so easy just to victimize the lady. Isn't it? And take the responsibility off the men. Everybody okay? David's the most powerful man in the world at this time. This is a young Jewish girl. She's scared. David finds out who she is. She's Ahithophel's granddaughter, David's counselor. She's Iliam's daughter. 
one of David's mighty men. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of David's most valiant soldiers. And he thinks, wait a minute. Nobody will know Uriah's off at battle. So is Eliam. He's off at battle. Ahithophel will never find out. I'm going to take her. I'm going to lay with her. And there's nothing nobody can do about it. And so he sends messengers to take this young girl. She's standing in front of the most powerful man in the world. And he says, fly with me. Knowing that she could die if she refuses, and she does it. Now, I am not saying that she should have. She is part to blame as well, but she's scared to death, and she does it. And now we have a problem. She gets pregnant. And David thinks, oh, my goodness, now everybody's going to know I've got to cover it up. I've got to cover it up. So he brings Uriah home, sends word to Joab, send Uriah home, her husband. Hey, Uriah, you're one of my most valiant men. I tell you what, won't you take a break? Won't you go spend some time with Bathsheba? Won't you go lay in your own house, in your own bed, and enjoy a weekend of leave with your wife? And Uriah was so valiant. He was so sold out for the cause that he wouldn't even go home. And he slept with the king's squadron at the gates. Then David said, that failed. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring him in and get him drunk. I'm going to get him drunker than Cooter Brown, and I'm going to send him home to sleep with Bathsheba, and he wouldn't do it again. And David thought, I'm in trouble. And so this temptation, which led to this adultery, now leads to premeditated murder. And he writes a letter to his general Joab, who done all David's dirty work, Seals it with his king's signet, hands it to Uriah. Uriah has no idea that he's carrying his death warrant back to the battlefield. Gives it to Joab. Joab reads the letter which says something to this effect. Put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle. Send him to the front line. Send him to the walls of the Ammonite city where he's easy picking for the archers and then withdraw all the troops from him. And Joab done exactly what David instructed him to do. And one of the most valiant soldiers in all of Israel's army died because he had character, because he had integrity, because he loved David. And then you find that David takes Bathsheba and he marries her. Man. And when you hear the name Bathsheba, the first thing you think of is scandal. The first thing you think of is something bad, something wrong, something negative. Now think about this. This oracle of this virtuous woman was spoken by Bathsheba. Man, I love when God does stuff like that. I love it when he uses a harlot like Rahab. When he changes the demoniac of Gadara. When he saves the Saul of Tarsus and turns him into the Apostle Paul. And today, can I tell you, if Bathsheba can give the definition, the oracle, paint the picture of the portrait of this virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. There's hope for every single solitary woman in here. Quit listening to the enemy about your past. Quit listening to the enemy about your current present situation. I'm telling you today with everything that's within me, ladies and gentlemen, your past scandals, your present situation does not prevent you from being a Proverbs 31 woman. It does not prevent you from being that virtuous woman. Why? because more powerful than your scandal is a savior more powerful than your sin is King Jesus and there's nothing more powerful than his resurrection he is on the throne he is in control and by his power his providence and through his grace you can be whatever he wants you to be but will you believe it oh, oh I trust the day that you will I trust the day that you will and I trust today that you will continue to walk in his purpose for you. What's your message to all the mothers this Mother's Day? God is still writing your story. God is still an ever-present help in the time of trouble. I don't ever want you all to look at Proverbs 31 the way you looked at it again. 
Because when I look at Proverbs 31, I don't see the perfection of the portrait of this virtuous woman. I see the grace of God. I see the power of God put on display. And I see the need for us to be connected to the Savior. Guys, isn't that what all this is about? To be the kind of wife and the kind of mother you need to be? For me to be the kind of dad and the kind of husband I need to be? I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I would fail. I would fall flat on my face in failure if it wasn't for the power and the strength of the Lord. But can I tell you, when I'm weak, He is strong. When I'm tired, He never rests. He never slumbers. When I feel like I'm at the end of my rope, I'm still standing on the rock that is Christ. And there's hope for you. You today, everybody in this building, but we got to look to Jesus. <coughs> Happy Mother's Day. God bless each and every one of you. Stand to your feet. Lord, thank you so much for the day in which you've given us. Lord, we're going to take communion now. Lord, this is a special time. Lord, we probably should have took it last week because that's the schedule, but we wanted to move it to this week so it'd be so special for Mother's Day. And Lord, we understand what this communion represents. We understand that this bread is symbolic of your broken body that was beaten and bloodied and bludgeoned on the cross for me, for each one of these people, for the sins of the world, and that this cup that we're partaking in with this juice is a picture of your spotless, sinless precious red wall crimson blood that was given for the remission of our sins. But God, we also understand that this is not a funeral service. We're not passing by your tomb and paying our last respects because you're alive, you're alive, you're alive. And we celebrate the fact that you overcame death, hell, and the grave. We celebrate the fact that you are our present tense Lord, not just our past tense Savior. We celebrate the fact that you're on the throne and in control. We celebrate the fact that you're coming back and every eye is going to see you and that you are going to right all the wrongs. You are going to judge the nations. You are going to usher in heaven upon earth. You're alive, Jesus, and you're making a difference in lives today. So help us to celebrate you through this communion. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name.